Okay. Um, buongiorno. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm very, very honored and uh, pleased to be in, in the city. And I wanted to thank everyone involved in the conference and for inviting me and uh, making me feel very welcome. Uh, I've got to see a lot of things that I wouldn't have normally got to see. So thank you, thank you. So um, I am a graphic designer by training. I went to design school in New York. Uh, Everything I know as a curator, everything I do as a curator, everything I do connecting to design history is coming from my background as a graphic designer. And I think it's very important to me. It may not be the most traditional thing, but I like it. I like it that way. Um, and I think it's the, it's the thing that connects me to the material. And that's mostly what I'd like to talk about today. This big question. <laughs> Does it really matter? Uh, so I have two presentations. Super short one. Yes, of course. Um, the end. And a slightly, slightly longer <laughs> lecture, which is this. So andiamo. Design history as a model for contemporary design practice. Uh, it's kind of wordy. Um, but uh, the idea for me has always been, how can I make the material that I find really fascinating aesthetically, conceptually, relate to my practice uh, and finding ways to then translate that to other designers, students. I teach quite a bit in New York City. Actually, my, my work to teach ratio is a little bit more on the teaching side, less, less work. But most of the things that I think about relate to this idea of how can I make these things that I find really fascinating connect to what we do. Um, design history is a history subject, so not always the most exciting. Um, and it's taught in a, m it tends to be taught in a more traditional way. Uh, and I actually don't know that there is a better way to teach it. So what I'm proposing is a little bit of a parallel, but it's a historical subject and you start somewhere like Lascaux or Gutenberg or uh, Cassandra, depends on who you have, how much time you have to devote, but you get sort of a crash course in the history. So how much in the United States, it's about 15 weeks, one semester, one class a week. So 15 times for maybe two, three hours. That's all you get, really. How do you cover anything deeply? Yeah, so it's just general context, which is, I think, important, and it's great. But then what? Or so what? Um, there are lots of books on the subject, many, many books. Um, these are some of the few ones. These are sort of the big, the big ones. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Paul Shaw. He's very uh, critical, uh, very good historian, designer, calligrapher, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of his blogs. Um, uh, I think Greg and Patricia, who are in the audience, designed this website. Um, but that's a screenshot of the, of the page. On the, on, I don't know if it's clear, but that's, that's a screenshot on the right. That's the full page. This is his comments and edits to one of the newer published design history textbooks. Right. This is how many mistakes and inconsistencies he found. Right, this is newly published, edited heavily, obviously. So it's not so easy. <laughs> it's, I, I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm not envious of, of the task involved in trying to put something like this together. You can't get it right. It's just, I've done this a few times now, and you do your best. <laughs> and your best is always often not good enough. So. Uh, and I think, <laughs> culturally, <laughs> sadly, we learn more from television. Uh, Medman, the Helvetica poster, uh, and nicely placed uh, piece by Seymour Quast, which is an exhibition, so it's worth taking a look at it uh, closely. Um, 
The problem that I think we have also is exacerbated by the internet. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. I use it every day. It's, it's, it's impossible to do what you do, what I do. It's the fir first place I go to for visual research. It's, I think, the first place we all go for visual research. Um, the problem is the way it functions. Uh, it's by popularity. Right? That's the, the convention of, of search engines. They want to give you the thing that's the most likely match to the thing that you're looking for. So you type in Swiss design, voila, Swiss design. How much of it is Swiss? How much of it is original Swiss? And do you care? <laughs> right? It depends on what you're looking for, how you're trying to find things out. So it's, it's, it's a big jumble out there. And we dig through it, we find the things that we want, but I think as designers we're often looking for the more unique things. It's just in general, like we want to do unique things, we want to find unique things. Um, that's not how Google works. Right? It's not about giving you the unique thing, it's about giving you the thing that matches the most. So you end up digging and digging and digging, and then you maybe find something, but you don't know if it's really old or if it's something like uh, the Swiss Dead Project which recreates uh, gig posters or band posters in kind of this Brockman uh, uh, Swiss style. Um, which the internet tends to perpetuate this idea of the surface. You know, so we have pixels and we're just looking at the images. You know, we collect the images, we see them on Instagram. It's, it's this very quick relationship that we have to this work. Think about what was the last time you looked at a piece of graphic design that wasn't yours for more than, I don't know, a few seconds? Let's say maybe 30 seconds, 60 seconds. It's, it doesn't happen that often. Especially, like, why would you want to stare at the screen other than you already do when you're doing your work? So it, 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 it's not the easiest thing. So can we actively use design in our daily design work? Uh, so you're staring at your InDesign screen. And you, can you actually be thinking about Herb Allen or Paul Rand? Like, does it ever enter this, this the stream of consciousness? It does because it's our legacy, it's our history. So of course, like the things we know are, are uh, habits and our formal cues are informed by by tradition and history and, and the things that we've been trained in. But it's subconscious. It's not conscious. What I'm advocating is a more conscious, actually, sort of thoughtfulness in order to make our work better, connecting to this historical context. And I think we just need the right perspective. I think we're not taught as designers how to look at graphic design. I think conferences are really great for that. I think we're all here for the same reason, to hear things, to hear the stories behind how work is made, to be inspired, to be educated. It's, it's the way we grow. I think it's not that different from interacting with historical material. We just need to have the same level of curiosity and ask the right questions and forget the surface, really. Like, the surface is, to me, a, a kind of a trifecta of, it's, it's a few things that come together. The time it's made, the tools that are used to make it, and your personal habits, your personal sort of, uh, training, you know, they, they kind of come together and they become the solution. But if you dig deeper and you can understand how work was maybe conceived of, which is usually a, a bit harder, but if you can conceive of, of uh, understand of how it arrived, you can take that to heart and you can take that and you can learn from it. The conferences do that. They sort of reveal the greater inter interaction between work. So I'm going to try to, you know, give us some of these tools. I'm going to try to deconstruct some of this work. So I'm going to do a big bit of a quick sort of jump through a few individuals, a few projects to give you some of the things that I've learned along the way being a curator. This is my seventh year uh, curating the collection, but I've been using the resources there for almost 20 years now. So I've, I've had time to sort of sit and contemplate and meditate on these things, so to speak. So I've arrived at some of the uh, insights that I think makes helps me be a better designer and I think will help everyone be a better designer. So 
uh, I was here uh, yesterday giving a talk at Creative Morning about the balance. So this is like a, a smaller kind of version of a slightly different kind of take on on the balance work. I find the balance is incredibly um, stereotyped. I mentioned this yesterday too, but. There are things that he's best known for, uh, which he didn't actually make himself. So this this kind of calligraphic style of lettering that he never touched. Uh, he had very, very skilled uh, designers, lettering artists working for him that executed most of this. This is John Pistilli, this is Tom Carnese. This is mostly theirs. So the stuff that's most popular and known about LeBellin is actually not fully his. You know, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and the other second thing he's best known for is the work for uh, the Avant-Garde magazine, which inspired the typeface, the logo inspired the typeface that kind of grew out of that. Uh, and I, I mentioned this uh, yesterday as well, but this is a hugely popular <laughs> image. I'm sure most of you have seen it at one point. It's image number six in Google image search. Uh, LeBellin didn't design it. Uh, he had probably zero to do with it. It's a business partner of his, uh, Alan Pekulik, who recently passed away, sadly. Uh, a very important designer who knew how to think in sort of the LeBellin studio way. He could come up with the ideas and he could also do the lettering. So LeBellin wouldn't do the lettering, other designers would do the lettering on his command, sort of on his, uh, under his art direction. Uh, Alan could do both. He could come up with the ideas and he could draw them, customize lettering type. It's a business partner. It's a small client. They don't have to have a partner's meeting to talk about this cover. It's very easy. It just gets done. So the full credits when you do find them in some obscure annual <laughs> reveal that little side story. But thanks to the internet, good luck trying to fix that story. It's almost unfixable at this point. Everyone will always, we can try to fix it, but it, it'll kind of stay in the balance camp. It's not to say it's bad, you know, it's okay. But there's other things that, that he should be better remembered for. Uh, and he was a partner in the studio um, that uh, did mostly advertising and it became actually an advertising on the kind of the, the reputation that he provided. So it became S, H, and L. This is another masterful piece of lettering by John Pistilli, uh, who specialized in this kind of Victorian revival of, of letter forms, really beautiful. Um, the full story of Eros is, is pretty fascinating, but I'll kind of give you the, the, the condensed version of it. Um, Eros magazine was published in 1962, uh, and its intent was to challenge American censorship uh, very, very directly. and, and almost foolishly so, kind of enthusiastically trying to uh, deal with, with the fairly strict amount of censorship that was around in the 1960s, actually 1950s in, in the United States. Um, and LeBellin um, connected with uh, Ginsburg in, in sort of a, kind of a symbiotic way. They, they weren't really good friends, I'd say. They, they talked a lot, but they figured out a way to work together, uh, which is interesting because um, with LeBellin, asked when he was given the choice to become the art director of this magazine, he asked for complete creative control, uh, which is sort of the holy grail of graphic design, to have a client that gives you all their money and lets you do whatever you want. You know, it's, it's more like art. This is an amazing artifact in that context that LeBallon had completely full free reign and he spent, Ginsburg, the publisher, put up a lot of money to publish this and, Gins and LeBallon took full advantage of the, the budget because he had creative control. Um, this first issue had the playing card, was a, re a reproduction of a playing card, uh, but it was tipped in. It was actually kind of printed. It was a physical object that was glued on top of this magazine. So that's hand labor. So uh, at this point, their circulation was about 25,000. So 25,000 copies plus maybe 30,000 had to be hand glued, right? That's a huge cost. Uh, the magazine itself had, uh, this one had four different paper stocks. Right? So that's probably four times the cost of what it should normally cost and it's hardcover. It's insanely expensive and there's no advertising. There's nothing to recoup the cost, but it's a really beautiful artifact. I talked a, a, a little bit about this uh, yesterday, but the second issue is 
probably my my favorite of of of, uh, uh, of most uh, probably of, of the work that Lou Allen created um, because it, it has his like fingerprints all over it. It's sort of uh, it, it's very easy to for me to to glean uh, a perspective on Lou Allen as as an art director from the choices that he's making here. Again, I'm showing the stuff that's mostly forgotten. This is not stuff that's remembered. We remember the calligraphy, we remember avant-garde, gothic, not necessarily even the magazine. But this is a really masterful uh, art direction. Uh, he's using the back uh, cover to entice you to sort of interact with the magazine. Uh, he's very aware of the object that is in your possession as a, as a reader, as a viewer. And he is in control or he, he knows that uh, a lot is expected of you and the object. This cost a lot of money to subscribe to, so there's quite a bit of uh, expectation from the audience. And he's trying to juggle that in, in the most elegant way and also s so kind of try to stay out of trouble. Uh, this is not a very safe thing to do in uh, the 1960s. Erotic content in any shape or form was, was quite heavily uh, censored. And this sort of worked, it kind of went through. But you know, he's, he's making you look at the back cover. So the front cover, the back cover, they're different where you, know, you don't really see them uh, as a same thing and you kind of look away. He wants you to spend as much time with this as he possibly can. You know, it's, it's not his decision to decide which articles are more interesting. He needs to treat every single article with the same respect and the same respect of the reader so that they can make a choice what they're interested in reading or not. That's, we, I, sometimes I feel like we forget that. We have a mutual respect of content and audience. And it's this very delicate kind of dance that we have to do. The end papers open up to this really beautiful photograph uh, from the same series that's captured on the front um, using this really beautiful red stock. And the back uh, is in blue paper. So two very, very, very expensive pieces of, of uh, paper just for this gesture. And the gesture to me is very Uh it's a, it's a day passing through the magazine. So you start with, with the day at the cover, you open it and it sort of accentuates the summer. It's a summer issue, so it's like this very subtle nod through like the red color kind of pops the, uh, the, the uh, so that it intensifies the experience and then you go through the content and it ends with like a blue or duskier kind of moment. So it kind of cr adds a little bit of a layer to it and it's you know, kind of captured. So it's one day in, in, in time. Um, the article that opens up this magazine is uh, called We All Love Jack, which is uh, a reference to John Kennedy. Insanely risky thing to do, uh, to, to just the idea of putting the standing president of the United States in 1962, essentially the most powerful person in the world, uh, in an erotic magazine. Right? The contrast there is astoundingly severe. It's not something you just want to just do. You would think very, very hard before you do that. This is not fun and games. This is a very, very serious gesture which beckons some repercussion. <laughs> uh, Beautifully typeset. The article is basically on the right panel, the right half, that's that full text, and the images that illustrate this article are very simple. Uh, there's no more text, really, no huge amount of text. Like some little, I wouldn't call them captions, just little, you know, kind of guidelines for some things, just like little commentary that they're making. But all the photographs in this uh, article are. Uh, news agency photographs. So the same photographs any newspaper would have access to. So they're just trying to tell a story, a visual narrative. Uh, and the visual narrative is that Kennedy is handsome. You know, he's he's has sex appeal. There's, he's an attractive uh, president, and it, it's sort of a known thing. I mean, it's it's just obvious. It's just there. They just want to put it up on the surface and talk about it. That's their definition of sexuality, that's their definition of, of an erotic magazine. Th this, this idea of humanity and, and very simple things that are kind of obvious to everyone. 
It's a very sophisticated magazine for that. It's not, it was never intended to be dirty. It was never intended to be like erotic in the, in, in the way that we tend to understand it. It was really, Ginsburg was very interested in, in a much more intellectual conversation. His ideas were rather harsh and severe and a little corny. And I think he needed a really, really, really good designer to just balance that. And I think probably Lou Ballin knew it from the first meeting. <laughs> and that's why he said full control. <laughs> my choices. Your ideas, my decisions of how we're going to present this. And I think that was this beautiful balance that they found. This is a, a astoundingly subtle and very biting commentary. If you look closely at the photographs, it's mostly women. So that's, that's the story that they're telling. We love Jack. We as women. Women love Jack. Yes, we all do, but he, they're alluding to, you know, the rock stardom of, of Kennedy. Like, this is a different time, different president. People didn't behave this way with Eisenhower. <laughs> I mean, a very old man, general, right? Like, this is not, this is new. This is new. This is ushering in the 20th century, sort of the, really the post-war 20th century. You know, women are fawning. And this gorgeous photograph of uh, Grace Kelly uh, as the Princess of Monaco visiting the White House. Um, and, you know, Kennedy with, with other people. And the other thing you start to notice is that his wife is not present in any single image. It's just, just editorial choice, right? Uh, last photo, that's the two of them, right? So how else could you read it other than like the relationship of women to Kennedy and his relationship to them and his wife? It's this beautiful <laughs> narrative that leaves you without any questions of what they want you to, to see. But the form and the material uh, choices that he's making, this off-white kind of paper and this really heavy stock and the slightly coarser half tone, which is not necessary for that kind of paper, pushes you into the newspaper world. You're, you're thinking of newspapers and you're treating this as reality. He's, he's, he's hinting heavily that this is real. And there's nothing artificial here. They just but they manipulate you to read it the way that they want you to read it. And it's really, really stunning. You know, so it's just, again, it's experience. You have a magazine, you have a page, and you lift, and that covers that image. It's a doubling of these images. Your brain is doing some subconscious mathematics about this and leaves you with no other option than to think what they want you to think. But they're like, we didn't do anything. It's just this thing, right? These are news photographs. We just show you news. How you see the news is, you, it's your choice, but they left you no choice. It's really, really brilliant. Uh, the next issue had the last photograph of, of Marilyn Monroe, uh, shot by Bert Stern uh, in 1962 in June. This was about six weeks before she died. So these are the last surviving photographs of Marilyn Monroe, professional photo shoot, uh, shot for Vogue. Uh, and I always talk about this to me, uh, it's kind of a, a strange cover, uh, especially s seeing the first, second issue that, uh, with, with this really beautiful lush photography on the second issue. You, they had access to over 2,000 photographs from this photo shoot. I bet there's one cover photo in that 2,000, 2,500 photos, right? Like, he's a really smart art director. He can find one image. He chooses to do something else. I'm not really sure how much it's LeBallon, how much it's Ginsburg, but it's a very conscious effort to do this, uh, which to me is yet again kind of a really beautiful uh, analogy to the content. They really understand what they're dealing with here. It's images of Marilyn Monroe. It's not Marilyn. Like, she's not, we're not in a film where there's sort of, when you look at an image, you're, you're entering the space of the photograph. Like, beautiful, strong imagery does that. And that's why our directors work really hard to kind of present you the right thing so that you can, you know, dive into it and just really be immersed. This is doing the opposite. It's just pushing you back. It's not about Marilyn and being one-on-one -on -one with Marilyn. This is like Marilyn's, but also photographs of her. These are production images. These are chromes. These are positive film. Uh, so it's multiples and also like in the images she's posing for the camera. 
So she's acting. So it's not really candid, it's not really her, per se. It's a persona, it's a projection of what she's trying to do. And they're making you aware of that, that this is an image of this person. And it feels like it's really removed from her, but she re-enters uh, the images by making the marks. The excess, the subtle kind of Xing in orange, are made by Marilyn. So she had this agreement with Bert Stern, where she would edit, so to speak, photographs. She would select the ones she didn't want, and obviously wouldn't want them to be seen, published. But they are published, and they tell this really amazing story in, that doesn't need any text. They don't need to say anything. You have this relationship to this photograph of a person, and the gesture of that person to that image. It's her reaction to the image. This is like, it, you can write a book probably, especially with Marilyn, right? The relationship Marilyn had with her image is the thing that probably led to her suicide, right? Whether you believe in it or not, whether there was a suicide, whatever. The fact of the matter is like she constantly struggled with this idea of how she's portrayed and projecting this. And so this is a gesture where she says no. Very simple, like an X is such a simple device. And it's almost impossible for them not to print this. I mean, ethically, maybe. But they choose to run it, and then I think we're probably better off for having access to this. Not just these perfectly selected images, but these. It's the, it's the chrome, it's, it's the film with her mark. And it's remarkable. And they don't hide it. It's the first, the very first thing they say in, in the beginning of the article. It's like a little preface to it. It says, all the marks, all the scratches, are intentional. They are made by her. And I think they knew that there might be some ethical tension. They said she was very happy with the photo shoot as a whole. So it's like, here it is. Here's the framework for which you can start looking at these things. Amazing art direction. Fourth issue, uh, the big story here was the Bible, uh, a counterattack, I would say, by Ginsburg to the people who were really bashing him for um, morality. And they're using the pretext of religion to justify their attacks. So he's like, let's just look at the Bible. Right? If you're using this framework to bash me, it's kind of hypocritical. It's in the Bible. All the things we want to talk about, it's in the Bible. And it's illustrated with these uh, 16th century engravings that illustrate the pa particular passages in the Bible that they wanted to highlight. So to me, it's sort of like their not so subtle example of stuff that was published in the 16th century that they're doing again. They're sort of like they're doing what they were doing in the 16th century. And why is that okay in the 16th century? In the middle of the 20th century, what we're doing is not okay. Because these are not like illicit images. These are perfectly fine published images. Um, but the big story, the, the really sort of the backbreaking story, unfortunately, became this one, black and white in color. It's a photographic essay, beautiful, beautiful photographs. A photographer is not really well known, but this has become quite symbolic of, of many things, but it's become so symbolic of the, the struggle, uh, American struggle, which still permeates throughout the American populace, the idea of race relations. Right? It's, it's, in 1962, this was impossible to conceive of. And the fact that it's shown is even more bizarre at, to the society at large. The idea of that there could be sexual relations between a black man and a white woman were impossible. The fact that it happened, sure. But legally, this was still a very medieval time in the United States. This was a fairly draconian framework. That this is something that I think they felt very. Um, they didn't think it was going to be a big deal. If it was a big deal, you could always tell with Ginsburg it would be the first or the second article. His sequencing of content was always like the thing I want you to t t to tell you the most would be in the beginning. This is second to last article, and this is not typical for him to just hide things. Um, uh, I mentioned this yesterday, Spike Lee recreated that photograph for Jungle Fever. Uh, he's very well aware of very particular design 
uh, and photo influences. So he used the actors to re recreate the image as a very intentional nod to that photograph. Uh, the crazy thing that happened, or I guess not so crazy because we live in the United States or I live in the United States, it seems kind of like every day. Um, it's a really interesting illustration uh, which illustrates the Christmas party for the magazine. Eris Magazine had a Christmas party. They're working on the next issue, issue 5, for the beginning of 63. And there's a messenger, uh, and that's Ginsburg on, on the left. He's being handed a, a letter, and the letter is a, a criminal indictment. He was charged with 20 counts, criminal counts, federal criminal counts, which is, you know, like way more serious than normal counts. And it's not civil. It's not like, oh, you did something bad. We should do something about it. He is facing, if he's convicted of the 20 charges, he's facing over 100 years in prison. He's facing about a million dollar fine. This is like really fucked up. This is really serious. And they knew this, right? It's not like, oh, Whoops, you, don't, you can't do that and not expect that there might be some pushback. And the pushback came from this person. Uh, that's Robert Kennedy, the General Attorney of the United States. After the president, you might even say the more powerful person in America than the president, because he can make a lot of things happen. So he's the, essentially the top lawyer. He crafts the criminal case probably a subtle or not so subtle payback for the article in the second issue. Because the scary thing for them was, A, it's expensive, so it reaches a fairly elite audience, and they tripled in subscribers. So they went from 25,000 to 75,000 in less than a year, right? That's really good metrics, right? Most magazines could aspire to, you know, that tripling. It scares the crap out of these guys, right? I think they thought maybe it'll die a slow death, you know, just, well, you know, it's, a, it's some weird, obscure magazine. I think it, it freaked them out to be in a dinner party <laughs> and have someone say, hey, do, do you see this Eris magazine? Like, that's inconceivable to them, right? This is too high. This is too high. So they're like, well, we'll make this go away. And they did. He's convicted, not of the obs obscenity charges, because, like, when they brought the magazine and the issues in court, there's really nothing to, to call into question. Playboy had been around by that point for about 10 years almost. But Playboy was, was published differently at different venues. So the, the obscenity charges didn't stick, but the charges that they get to stick are, it's very Americana, uh, pandering. <laughs> he sent nine million cards to get people to, to subscribe to this magazine. And what they used in court are those cards. They said you made people think that they were buying pornography. And buying pornography and getting it through the mail is a federal crime. So you're guilty for them. <laughs> you made them do this. So you have to be punished for it. And they got those charges to stick. That's the you know, legal definition of 1963. And he got five years in prison. Five years for a very mm, conservative thing. Right? He starts appealing, again, the, the legal mumbo-jumbo of America. It's actually taking them, it's going to take them 10 years to actually physically move him to prison. He appeals and appeals, he loses everything, he loses a lot of money. There's a Supreme Court case in three years, loses everything. N no chance, he's got no chance. And in 1972, he goes away on a lesser, uh, lesser sentence. They reduced it to three years. So he spent eight months in prison in 1972 for this magazine, but he fights back. <laughs> in less than six months, he has a new magazine called Fact. The Ballon is designing this for free. He got paid a small fee for Eros. He's making a very small amount of money. And Le Ballon is, by this point, is on his own. Le Ballon was very dissatisfied with American advertising, and I think he felt very confused by how bad things were, and Eros magazine was his platform to escape. He took full reign of the opportunity that came his way, loved designing, he, he lived design. I mean, this is like a person who went to work every Saturday, right? No one went to work on Saturdays, right? He went to work every Saturday and at home on Sundays he did work. <laughs> he worked non-stop. He worked until he died, 1981. He didn't need to do this. He continued to do this because I think he felt responsible, because he wasn't named in the lawsuit. 
you know, because they didn't really care about the magazine, really. They just cared about the guy who had the ideas. Fact Magazine is a really brilliant gesture of design. It's very intentional. The, the brilliance that I, I, I find is sort of the relationship it has to the cover. It's a small format. It's about kind of a A3, maybe. Uh, maybe A4, closer to A4. Uh, but the, the, the brilliance is in the gesture and the attitude. It's the logo with a colon, which creates the construction. Fact, colon, blank. So you're reading the name of the magazine, which is to him, obviously, a very, very important thing. It's not, I use the reference of Time magazine. It's one of the, you know, one of the highest publications. Or let's say Vogue. Vogue or, or um, Time. Whenever you pick up those magazines, it's a brand. You don't actually think about the word because they've established such a strong connection to you with that name. But you don't think about the notion of time, right? You're not like, what time is it? It's just, oh, the red thing. It's this news weekly. This is very different. He needs you to think about facts. And the only way he knows as a typographer is to make it active. So he's creating this. So it doesn't ultimately matter what it looks like. The graphic design, I mean, it's so weird to say that, but it's the idea, like the, the brilliant gesture of doing this and making us think about this word. That's, to me, what's striking, and that's profoundly, profoundly smart from a designer. And that's why I said Ginsburg wasn't shy. This is the person who just sent them to prison. All right. You can fill in any dirty four-letter word in there. Many come to mind. But this is this guy, like, th he's not afraid. Um, I love this uh, LeBallon thing of taking the dot off the I because it clashes with the comma. It's very subtle, it's very small. You don't really even notice, you just read it very easily. Beautifully typeset. Uh, he worked for Coca Cola this year. He designed Sprite. Sprite was launched this year. He designed Sprite packaging. The project went south, I think. Uh, he never, ever talked about it, he never showed slides of it. And the only one reference I found to it uh, is he, a, a little short quote from him saying that they worked very closely with the Coca-Cola designers, which is basically industry language of like, they did it. I had nothing to do with this. But the same year he comes out with this, right? So you work with a giant corporation, you get burned. It's not payback, he's, but he's doing this because he can. He has this choice and I think he feels some moral obligation to do this. This, this issue, uh, first year, 64, Ralph Nader, uh, I guess the only alternative party that we have in the United States, the leader of the Green Party, the founder of the Green Party, a very unsuccessful political machine because America is very much a two-party system, but he's the most visible. This is the beginning of his career, the very beginning of his career. He wrote this article, actually, Ginsburg put his name on it, but it's mostly Nader. This article leads to a big story. He publishes a book, and this is him testifying in Congress about how bad American cars are. With, and, and this is incredibly you know, serious and true. This was a fact, hard, hard fact. This changes. It creates a context where the auto industry is forced by the government to create safety standards, which they didn't have. They're like, we don't have to do anything. The government says, they were like, oh my God, we didn't know. We should do something about it. It's our obligation, so they create safety standards. So thankfully, now American cars have seat belts, which were not optional back then. Right? So you just have a car, and it just does its thing, and then it crashes, and everyone dies. That's how serious things were. This is a life-changing thing. Right? Small magazine. This now is known as the Goldwater Rule, which is a, mm, becoming very well-versed because of how we find ourselves today. Uh, this is a, a candidate for the 1964 election. He lost the election, but he remembered this little magazine. He sued them for $2 million. He won because they proved in court that Ginsburg, being a very excellent editor, took the letters and just made them a little bit punchier. Right? Like some words that were a little soft, he's like, oh no, we'll just change this. So in the court, they compared his letters to what's published, or their letters, and they're like, well, you lied. You lose. Goldwater got one dollar. I think it was an intentionally symbolic gesture, not two million, one single dollar, but he got uh, lawyer fees paid by Ginsburg. Shuts this down. But forever now we have the idea or this, this notion, this rule, the Goldwater rule. The psychiatrist 
Association, the big kind of body of psychiatrists in the United States, have agreed after this to abide by ethics, a higher standard of ethics where they're not allowed to comment on anyone in the public eye. It's not their patient, it's not their duty. Let's not do this. <laughs> so in this last year, I guess we're almost a year into the uh, results of the last election, this is heavily, heavily talked about. Lots of psychiatrists have actually come out and said maybe this is not a good time to abide by the Goldwater rule. Right? This is the thing that created that, and now we're talking about it again. Very few people know this magazine. <laughs> Very few people. This is the thing that caused it. A designer didn't have to do this, you have to remember. He didn't need to do this. This is actually pretty bad for business. There's the Mr. Goldwater. He sues, he wins. The magazine gets closed within three years. Uh, they published about 22 issues. Six months, he starts another magazine. He just moved. Never physically, he just moved on. Same staff, same office. He just re-registered the magazine. No big deal. And just kept fighting. You know, fighting in court, not successfully, but fighting through what he had to say. And LeBallon was always there with him. I don't think, I know that LeBallon was not as radical by any stretch of imagination as in the way that Ginsburg was, but he understood what Ginsburg needed as a client. And he felt the duty to do these kinds of things because things kind of sucked at the time. Uh, and LeBallon understood that things kind of sucked. And as a designer, I think he knew that you can try to change things, you know, maybe subtly. I just showed you a bunch of examples of how things radically changed <laughs> through a very masterful designer who knows how to step back. Um, this is another thing that, that we often kind of forget, the amazing content that sort of lives within a lot of these design objects. This is a, seri a series of drawings done for the magazine uh, about Muhammad Ali, or, or actually drawings by Muhammad Ali. I mean, it's like it's signed by him, the, the title of the, the headline is by him, the drawings are signed. This is one of the most obscure American facts. Uh, Ali is a hugely influential figure, very important. Very few people know he drew, very few people, even fewer people know that he drew these. They're hidden, or not, they're in plain sight, but they're in this magazine. You have to just get by the first issue, which can go maybe as high as $100. That's kind of the, the top ceiling. <laughs> For $100 to find the only place to find drawings by Muhammad Ali, I think people sh could pay a little bit more than that. I think it's this bit of history. The drawings were lost by the magazine, most likely. 99% sure that the magazine, when they folded, this folded with it and just disappears. No one can find these photographs, I mean these drawings. So, 100 bucks, you have the only surviving, essentially, copies of these drawings. And they're really fascinating. Uh, he says, the best part is he annotated, he explains what's in the drawings. So it's his voice telling you what's in the drawing, how to see the drawing. I mean, they're pretty straightforward, but still, it's his voice which is fascinating. He says, people always ask him at the end of the fight, when he just won, what he thinks about, and that's his answer. I think about money, and going to the bank with this money that I just won. Very Muhammad Ali, so. Uh, but then there's other things that are a little bit more intense. He just converted to, to Islam, he became a Muslim. He joined the Nation of Islam. He refused to be drafted in the Vietnam War. <laughs> it's a pretty crappy time for Muhammad Ali. He was put on trial for that. He was convicted. Uh, and he was basically in this really kind of a sinkhole. He didn't really have much going for him. So these are drawings exactly at that time when he's just processing a lot of crap. Uh, so he's talking about religion, you know, free Islam offers freedom, justice, equality, past religions has offered, in a little type, you can't really see it, but for the colored Negro, slavery, suffering, death, Christianity. Good luck finding that anywhere from Ali. A hundred dollars, at most. It's, it's this level of history that we forget that lives within these design objects. These are the close-ups for these. Really nice. Um, the whole series. And so this magazine dies, sadly, because Ginsburg has to go to prison. And he never published again. He goes away for eight months, nothing, ever. Which is what they wanted. Right? That's how you break someone. <laughs> I think he was just like, it's kind of intense. Eight months, okay, minimal security at prison, still. You've been convicted and you go away. And he's like, fuck it. I don't care anymore. And he actually ends up doing something that he always hated. He becomes a 
like a, a kind of trashy photographer for tabloids. He always hated tabloids, but he was kind of left with no choice. Um, but this is amazing lasting legacy. There he is going to prison in March of 1972, the official. You know, so this is the uh, end papers of the, of the book that he wrote. It's called Castrated. It's about arrows. So it's very much uh, a Ginsburg thing, and it's designed by LeBallon. So let's not forget these kinds of things. They're completely obscure, sadly. Uh, I'm trying to get the, the word out for, for these, and they're very easy to find. eBay is your friend for many things, but you can find most of this quite easily. It's a little, it, most of them reside, sadly, for, for you guys in the United States, so the shipping might be a little bit more expensive, but it's worth it. It really is worth it, or at least to know. We've been involved with a project that's digitizing all of the issues. So the Eros is available and Avantgarde is available. Uh, we're working on fact, so you'll have access to everything. You know, as high res, I mean, you could read the articles. It's at least useful. I mean, you, won't, you can't print them, but you can interact with it, and you could see the entire span, and you can see some amazing, amazing things in there. So let's not forget. Two, Carl Gerstner. Amazing, amazing designer. And the more I'm, I'm learning about him, the more I'm sort of enamored by his thinking. Let's talk about two projects quickly. Capo Magazine uh, was published by the same publisher as Twen Magazine. Uh, Twen is much better known. Uh, Capital was a super high-end uh, uh, business magazine. So it's like he wanted this to be CEO level. Um, the magazine is pretty fascinating in that it never had a con consistent logo. There's no logo. The logo is this repeat. Um, and the choice of font, which is kind of oddly not very modernist for uh, Gerstner. And the choice of font is because it's the same font used for the first edition of Karl Marx's Capital book. So it's, it's his, everything is thought through, like a million times over, so I'll demonstrate. This is the famous grid for this magazine. You maybe may have seen it. It's this kind of an insanity, like what is this thing? How do you even make sense? Like, grids should be simple, right? Like, to use, right? Like, you encounter this, like, what is this? Like, well, how do I start? It's actually dead simple. The, the, and that's Gerstner. Man, it, this guy is insanely brilliant. So it starts with a grid of type. Type size and spacing that creates the sort of the small raster. You know, it's flipped, so you have this interaction. So that gives you the, the smallest kind of pinpoints where things can align to. And then he starts drawing s squares. Big square, one square, two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five, and six by six. They overlay each other. And that's that insanity, because <laughs> he's seeing all of them. He needed a system that allowed him to make columns of text that were one column, two column, three column, four column, five column, and six. That's his expectation. That's his setup. He knows the content. He's thought through, he's to me one of the most in interesting designers because he always thinks about the very, very, very end. Not like, let's just like play around, like let's you know, doodle, make some sketches. He is insanely thoughtful in every step of the way. If he didn't need six columns, he wouldn't have made six columns. I flipped through the first issue, I was just kind of curious, like, oh, you know, like, I make grids, you know, I use some of the grids, some not. First issue uses one column, two column, three column, four column, five, and six. If he didn't need the six, he wouldn't have made the six. He is doing anything and everything because he needs it. Uh, and it's kind of amazing. And he uses it really, really well. It's a little misleading often, like when it's shown, and I guess maybe I should show that too, but the grid only involves the main central square of the magazine. is just a little taller than a square, which given how intense that grid is, gives you free air at the top. Usually the headlines go in there, so that's not included in the grid. So it's the grid with air on top. Stuff can float, it's very Swiss. He, he's very meticulous about allowing white space to come into it. So you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Everything fits. Beautiful. Orange stock. Silver and black, that's it, two colors printing. He's cracking <laughs> the silver to make the lines come through. It's not red printing, it's just, you know, it's like subtle, but two colors on red stock, nice. 
Everything is an accident, grotesque. His favorite. And you see the covers, they're all, so as I said, no logo, just a repeat of the name. And that's the branding. And if you flip the, the pages, if you flip the cover, there's a little uh, explanation. He wrote out the explanation that helps you understand the cover. It's not like, this is a cool pattern. Every single one, like, he talks about some, um, like, Minotaur's uh, labyrinth. <laughs> So it had to do with content. There's something that connected to it. So it's not like a cool pattern of the name. It's like a pattern that's really cool. It's the brand, but it's also very symbolic to him. Like 1961, a magazine that does not have a consistent logo. Right? He's 20, 30, 40 years ahead of his time. Like this, this modularity that you find in his work is unbelievable. Um, Il Magazine that you guys are maybe a bit more familiar, it's not familiar to us in the States, sadly, it's, it's kind of a shame, but it uses the framework from the Gerstner grid, including sort of the logo fits into the, like it's the small unit of the Gerstner grid. So it's the same principle of overlaying of square grids to create. So it's still relevant. I've seen a really terrible magazine that, that used the grid that just, that just like had no idea what they're doing. This is a very subtle and very smart way of reviving that idea. Right? It's literally just reviving this construct. Because it's a subtle, sensitive understanding of what you're dealing with. Right? And you have to kind of, I want to reiterate these ideas. You don't have to design like Gerstner, but you can think this way. You can learn a lot from this. There's a lot that, that still comes through. Right? And here's an example of like a, almost a direct reappropriation. We appropriate all the time. It's no big deal. LeBallon was shameless in appropriation. Project number two by Gerstner. Uh, branding packaging for in-store. Co-op is, you know, I think the, there's co-op here in Italy. This is the, the, the Swiss co-op. There's a co-op in Britain. So they're trying to compete with uh, Persil, the big detergent uh, powder. Uh, this is, so this is like a smaller kind of thing. And he's giving them this amazing, amazing, beautiful packaging. This is uh, 1964, uh, 65, I think. Ads which he designed, he loved advertising. So LeBallon hated advertising. Gerstner was enamored by advertising and spent most of his sort of mature phase moving fully into advertising. But he made really beautiful ads. So this is the packaging. The beautiful thing about the packaging is, is how it's conceived of. It's, it's, uh, it's meant to link together. All right, it's, a f it's a system. Everything to Gerstner is a system. He wrote a book called uh, Designer's Program, or um, is that the name? Designing Programs? So everything is programmatic <laughs> from the 60s. He's predicting computation. Uh, it's designed in this really simple way. You know, there's a very simple graphic that represents you know, detergent, you know, soapy water, kind of slushing, swashing around in, in the machine. Um, and that's the, the drawing, essentially. You know, so the idea for something that can combine is that you have to just hit the edges. Right? Al always in the same place. Whatever happens in the middle happens in the middle, but you just have to hit the corner. Super simple. You know, three divisions, and just hit the corners. And it's this you know, undulation. He's doing three. Uh, you know, the brand consists of three different types of detergent. So, okay, so one is this, one is this, one is this. It's just amplitudes changing. Right? So then each one has its own defining pattern, but it's coming from the same idea, right? So it's, I try to redraw it, it's very simple. Combining, right? And they fit together, always, in any permutation, right? So that's the old stuff. <laughs> the new stuff, way better. Um, but it gets even better. This project gets better and better. Um, so you take the same design, reduce it by a quarter, move the lines, because it's just a drawing, just split the part, fill it in, and then you have the spine, the edge of the box. So one artwork, that's it. You just need to draw it once. And now you have this. It's control. <laughs> There's no way you could screw it up in the store. You will display it however you want, and it's almost like you would want to do this. That's the brilliant thing. It's like, how, why not take advantage of it? It fits any shelf, it fits any, it's utterly brilliant because he wants you to do that. He wants the store to do that. So he's thinking of the end. 
not like I'm going to make a nice cool packaging. He's thinking of the display of this packaging. Right? The end, you know, he's thinking about the consumer. And it's kind of amazing, you know, just do whatever you want with it. Like, just, and it's just this, this exuberance. But like I said, it's one drawing, right? Three lines, slight different amplitudes. That's it. That's all it took, right? How long would it take? A day to draw, right? But he's thought this through. He thought of the end, how it's going to get displayed. Of course, right? You walk by the store, <laughs> they just have the detergent <laughs> lining the windows because it's so amazingly beautiful, and especially with the colors. Okay? It gets better. I've been looking into his work. He's, he was a very serious, active artist. So he's, he's doing a lot of artwork. So he's very interested in these like permutations. So he's making an artwork that is layered in pieces and you could you would buy the artwork but you could customize it. You can move the layers in different arrangements and you can move the pieces around. So it's it's almost endless possibilities of kind of living artwork. He's like you get bored with it, just rearrange it and now it's a new piece. So I was like, wow this is cool. But it's like, oh something reminded me. Right? So then I found how he made that artwork. Right? So he's thinking fully. So it's a circle, and then you, it's like the square grid. <laughs> you just divide it and divide it and divide it into circles. And you have that, which allows you to fill in along the contours, the big contour, small contour. You get these really beautiful forms, and he's just making, he makes a few that he likes, and that's the end artwork. It collapses itself. But that's exactly how he made those things. Right? Just he made a grid. And then he drew within the grid. So it's not like these are just nice waves. He made a grid <laughs> to draw waves. It's insane. But it's so thoughtful and so interesting. So again, you don't have to do this. Your work doesn't have to look like Gerstner's. But you can think the same way. You know, he's doing different things, you know, but he's aware of the end product. He's thinking the magazine is built because he sees the content and he knows exactly what the publisher wants. And he's doing that sort of delicate balance. This is about presentation. You know, packaging, it's going to be in a store, right? Companies spend, I'm sure big global companies spend billions of dollars. If you ever have seen or worked with Unilever or any of those companies, they build one-to-one -one replicas of supermarkets. And they make the products, the prototype, it goes on a shelf, and they film people to see how people react to it. This is common now. He's doing this back then, but he's doing this, you know, obviously in a more subtle kind of way. The last project, Unimark. Bob Norda and Massimo Vignelli. Um, Bob designed um, the, the signage in Milan. It's really beautiful graphics, like thinking about how people can see through the train, what they can see. It's really thoughtful. It's, you know, a very important piece of design, which is still there. At least the red line is, is consistent. Um, the logo that they never used, I guess they used it somewhere, but it's his projection for the metro uh, line. But the project I want to show you is this, which you have probably have seen. This was a Kickstarter campaign to republish. This is one of those first facsimiles, right? Over 100,000 of these were sold. Right? That's one of the biggest success stories of facsimiles. Lots of people have this. I don't know, maybe some of you have this. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating artifact. It's beautiful because it's like a beautiful object, but it's deeper than that. It's very, very interesting. This is what signage in New York City looks like in 1965. This is not the 40s, this is 1965. This is sad, very sad. Um, it doesn't work, clearly. <laughs> Like, for example, the, well, which one? Um, the second sign from the left there. Where do you need to stand to read that sign? Because you have this other sign in front of it. And then, look, there's another sign hiding. And plus, don't stand there. Like, don't do anything and just be confused all the time. So this sucks big time, right? So their, their Unimark is invited to redesign this. And this is a very important example of the beginning of what we now sort of use as UX, user experience. This sucks on a lot of levels, but you don't just change the font. That doesn't make the design better, right? It's a facelift. It's 
boring. It doesn't ma it make sense. Bob had the experience of doing the signage in Milan, so he had the experience and the expertise of how you conceive of it. So you need to find out what people are looking for. Right? If you're doing wayfinding, you find out what they're looking for, and then you help them give that information. That's not a font. Font in the design is not secondary, but it's lower in the process. It's later. You need to do this research about what people want to know. And then you figure out the answer to their questions. And then you then think about the right framework, the, the right conditions to present it. And that's what was really brilliant about this manual. It's this very subtle, or not so subtle, very clear explanation of user experience in its beautiful form. So schematics show the station and the kind of signage that there needs to be, and the fact that you don't need all of the information everywhere. Right, that's the problem with the other sign, the photo, rather. It's like, what am I looking for? I don't know, because I have so many things to, to read. <laughs> the last thing you want to be doing in the subway is reading. Right? There's enough things to do to worry about. This is like, you need some information here, and just that, and some, inf some different information here. And you do the legwork. Bob did a, an, an insane amount of research trying to figure this out the same way in Milan. So this is a really, really crazy kind of project. But it came together in a fairly quick amount of time. By 1970, this is when, when this was published. Uh, in, in a very clear uh, visual representation of the signage. Uh, and the typeface is sort of almost a secondary. He designed kind of a custom version of a typeface for the Milan sign uh, metro system. This was <coughs> uh, pretty much off the shelf um, accidents grotesque, which is in the United States is called medium, uh, sorry, standard medium, the medium weight of standard. Accidents grotesque doesn't really work in the US. Uh, so it's called standard, the most kind of traditional name. So this is the, the specification for the typeface, and everything is spec to be three sizes large, medium and small. So don't scale. Do not do the thing that that sign suffers from. There's like 50 sizes, you know, because they're like, you know, this needs to be bigger. Like there's no consistency. Train your user by seeing things over and over and they understand the visual language. You know, you have to pare down. It's all about sort of this paring down. The other brilliant part about this whole project is not the signage. The signage is pretty remarkable, right? It makes this really clear kind of uh, experience of, 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 of navigating the subway. The second brilliant part is the manual itself. So this is not a public-facing book, right? Why would the public care what the stuff looks like? This is for the sign makers because Unimark is an agency. They're not making any of the signs. They can't, right? Every station probably has 50, 60 pieces. Right, they're not making the artwork and sending it off to the printer and then checking it, like, you know, respace it. No, the agency has to do it. The MTA, the, the transit authority, has to do it. So if you guys have worked with big projects, implementation of something of the scale is usually the hardest thing. That's where things go really, really wrong, right? You just turn it over and you hope to God that things work out. You cross your fingers, you go to church, and you really just hope that it works out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So as a designer, you could be like, when it doesn't work, you can say, whoops, it's their fault. <laughs> they don't understand design, <laughs> it's their problem, right? You can do that, which you know, it's a very reasonable thing to do. There's also another thing you could do. You can also think about where it's gonna fail. And this is exactly what they do. They figured out the design language, and then when they're designing the manual, which is what Vignelli did, he thought about where it'll break on implementations. And he said, let's not break it. Let's help them. Rather than blame them, <laughs> we can maybe help them make this better. As designers, we want control. Like, he would be embarrassed if his signage looks terrible, right? It's, it's his reputation. So he's like, well, I want it to be good. So the first place it'll probably break is the spacing. Right. It has to be large, the, the, the weight of the, the, the typeface is quite large, and it has to be really tight. You know, it's one of the things that, that Helvetica did really, really well. You could space it really, really tightly and retain legibility. Excellence Grotesque comes closer to it, closest, but 
Helvetica was the, the best at that. But, and uh, oddly, no one knows exactly why uh, accidents grotesque uh, and not Helvetica. It's just like a choice that they made and kind of, well, it is, it is what it is. So, you know, you have spacing, and this is like, again, to the sign makers. This is how these letters space. You know, some are closer, some are further, et cetera, et cetera. They help you. You turn the page. It's a matrix of all of the letter combinations possible. So they went through the spacing of this font manually, and they created data points for the sign makers. Don't screw it up, please. Also, don't spend a bazillion years spacing it, like, oh, a little over. No, you know. Don't worry. <laughs> we solved it for you. So you look at the chart. So B, R. B and the R is a two. Done. Easy. So it's ingenious because it's foolproof. I mean, it, it'll fail if they just don't look at the chart. But why wouldn't they not look at the chart? <laughs> it's more work for them. This is easy. It's like, you've fixed it. So, and then, so I found that like, kind of strikingly smart and useful. And then I, I asked the question, how, what, what does that mean? <laughs> what is two? There's three sizes. It's two inches. It's like, is it a percent? Is, you know, so I, I just um, flipped back to the page. And I read that caption, which is the most useful thing you can do with an artifact like this. We have a copy in the, in the collection. Um, the reprint is, uh, is Pentagram's copy. But I just read the caption. And the way that they did it is kind of brilliant. So because you were not allowed to scale, the book, the manual, includes the master artwork for every letter at the three sizes and every number at the three sizes. So because these signs are made photographically, this is the artwork to use. You know, here's this letter, here's this letter. So you have alignment. You need alignment marks so that things stay straight. Right? So you have alignment marks. So they take advantage of the alignment necessary in creating these, these compositions. So B and the R, right? B, R is two. This is what two looks like. B, R, B, R. Overlay the marks. It's like, so, right? I've just trained all of you <laughs> in the spacing of the system. What, like a minute? It's foolproof. It's like you understand the overlay, right? Lines, they converge. They converge different ways, and it's just that simple. So you need these alignment, and they find like a clever way to insert a design decision that keeps everything intact, keeps everything sort of clear. It is so simple. And that's one of the small things in there. But like I said, they could have just been like, bah, it's going to be great, and then it's not. This was designed in 1970, right? This is, as a sign system, is still in use. It's changed a little bit. It's Helvetica rather, rather than uh, accidents. The colors have changed. Small cosmetic things have changed. Very imperceptibly uh, small changes. So it's about almost 50 years old, the sign system. It still works, right? Because if this failed in the first few years, it would not be here, right? This would have been changed. <laughs> and you spend more money and do it again. So you do it right once, which means you have to think about not just the UX of the design, but you also have to think about the implementation, right? And that's that concept. You don't have to design a sign system for the subway. But you can use that as a concept in bigger projects, bigger scale projects. I read the caption, and that sort of revealed this to me. So I'm hoping that you guys can ask the right questions when you look at the work. So we can actively use it. It's very possible. It's very easy. It's, it's just a matter of perspective. Don't treat it as an image. Treat it as a thing that has substance, and ask the right questions. How do they do that? Why? Right? I was just curious. The, the, the three kind of case studies that I showed you are things I just became really curious about. It's like, how does this even work? It's cool, I like it, but 
and then you know the next question, the next question. Now I you know have that as a designer. It's in my toolkit. <laughs> if I need it, when I need it, it'll come and and be helpful and be very useful. It it's very easy, I think, right? So we need this parallel to the chronology, the timeline. We need this thing. It'll help us be better designers. We all want to be better, right? You guys are here because you want to be better. This is the same thing. Our legacy of design has so much to give. We, you know, we're so forward thinking. Let's be forward thinking, but with kind of a hand kind of in the past and just, you know, pillage around there, like sort of thumb through and like use, use those things. Um, one of the ways we've been trying to, to, to use our platform as, as an archive, not just allow access to people uh, who want to come. If you guys are ever in New York, please stop by. Uh, it's about 20,000 pieces of graphic design you can physically thumb through. We've been trying to find ways that we can connect to a bigger audience. So we have a project called Flat File. These are flat files, hence the logo. Little flat files, two Fs. So it, it's this idea of you know revealing something, you know, because that's how we are. You know, you come to the space, you open drawers, and you find magic. <laughs> it's cool. It's very nice. Um, so a flat file is uh, a series. It's a digital magazine, so to speak. So it's just us, me. <laughs> mostly me and Anton, who designs this really beautiful designer, uh, works for ReadyMag, actually works for Pinterest now. But we collaborate on this, uh, and it's just our way to t try to tell some of these stories. You know, it's, like a, it's a little slow, uh, actually super fast. It's like three, five minutes, you know? So we're trying to create these little bits of content where you can just explore things and find things. So we have, in, you know, the first issue is about fact. I have a, an issue on Teddy Math. I have an issue on uh, Capital Magazine. So all of the things, many of the things I just talked about are kind of you know, in, in this, you know, in each issue, so to speak. The digital issue will take you about five minutes. So on your way to work, you know, you can have a little dose of inspiration, but the right kind of inspiration, right? But this is what we do. This is, you know, we feel an obligation to do that, but you can do this on your own. I spent the part of the morning on, at the flea market so easy to find amazing pieces of design and it's dirt cheap. So use the market, find things, use them, but ask the right questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. A lot of inspirations. Uh, maybe in the room there are some questions for Alexander, some curiosity. No question. Too much inspiration, I think. Um, no, I, I, wouldn't, I would like to stress a bit your role, I mean, a, a curator in, in, in this space. Because uh, during these days, we, we have seen a lot of uh, designers, a lot of uh, studies, a lot of agencies uh, that, show, uh, that are showing their works. And, and you are sh showing other people's works. So I mean, your, your role as a creator is uh, take my curiosity. I, I would like to, I mean, your opinion about this. Um, it, it's, uh, I think it comes from, like I said in the very beginning, it comes from just being a designer. Um, uh, the perspective I have as a designer, I came to design because I was curious about things I was discovering. Like my, my first introduction to graphic design really in the way that I understand graphic design was in the archive. So I was just fortunate enough to be at the school that owns this, this magical collection. And I didn't know design, I didn't want to study design yet. And I just th saw these things and they're really, really interesting. And I, I could tell that there's something to them. I could tell that there's like a, some energy to it. There's, there's something beneath it and, and it just clicked. You know, like we all have subtle reasons why we become designers and most of it is visual acuity. Like we, 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 we are surrounded by visual material and we filter things out. We find things that are interesting. So I think designers are, in general, are curators. I think that's what we naturally do. I'm not trained as a curator, and I actually kind of I'm thankful for, for not having that sort of... So I do things in completely my own idiosyncratic ways. Um, but it's helpful for me because I think we do that as designers. I mean, I think 
a good percentage of the people who find like really interesting things in flea markets are designers. We like these things. We want to be surrounded by them. And I think this curiosity is sort of within all of us. You know, you curate your space. You know, like look around every design studio. Like designers are really curious about what other design studios look like. Right? Like, what do you have on your walls? What kind of books do you have? I think we do that naturally. You know, do you s arrange your books by color? Right? Are you that kind of designer? Are you doing? You know, you have sort of a. a esoteric ephemera and like sort of like it, we all have that I, mean, I think we do curate constantly and maybe a little bit in the work as well so I think it's it that's why I, I, I I'm just trying to sort of give that lens you know like find the things that you're curious about be really curate you know like think about it much consciously like like one thing I've I've now realized that curators do is they find things, they put them together, and they try to figure out how to present them to the audience, the public. You know, it's not that sim dissimilar from what designers do. We put a bunch of stuff together and we pass it out to people. You know, it's like sort of project it out. But use it as a tool. Right? The things that you might have in your house. Right? If you if you have a copy of the Vignelli uh, um, Bible, <laughs> the the uh, Graphic Standards Manual, read through it. Just find something that's, that's interesting. Read through the design books. I have many design books, as I'm sure you all have. I have not read most of them. I'm sure it's the same for most of us. It's when do you have time to read these? But maybe make time, you know? It's not easy, but you know, stuff you have, you have it for a reason. Use it, you know? Like, be a curator, be curious, you know? I, I, I really think that that's, very useful, very helpful. It's helped me, you know, and, and I feel sort of an obligation to find the interesting stories and like pass them out to, to the audience and, and do it. But I think we do it naturally. I think we're all curators. Thanks again.